season. Have you ever heard the phrase, life is full of surprises? I think it's a phrase that is being worn out this year in 2020. If you, I think you'd agree with me on that. But here's the thing, the older I get, the more true an axiom it becomes. And as I look back on my life, there are so many things that I have experienced or gone through that I could never have planned as a teenager or even a young adult. Uh, life is full of surprises. Have you ever, ever wondered why that's the case? I think it is in part because God is actually a God of surprise. God does surprising things. He does things in ways that we could never plan. He does things in ways that we could never really understand before it happens. And sometimes even after it happens, we don't fully understand it. I think there are uh, two types of people in the world. I've come to discover that. And I, I really discovered it uh, in the early part of my, our, my marriage. There's the first type of person who actually enjoys surprises, or maybe a better way of putting it, likes planning surprises. And then there's the second type of person. The second type of person does not love experiencing surprises. So it was a few years into marriage and I had this great idea. It was coming up to our anniversary and I thought, hey, let's celebrate our anniversary. I will plan a surprise getaway weekend for Pam. And I took it like to that next level where I just said, hey, honey, we're going away and I'm going to surprise you with it. So I didn't tell her where we were going, nothing. I even packed her bag. Like I put all of the clothes in that she would need, bathing suit, all that kind of stuff, so that there would be nothing that would give her a hint as to where we were going. I even bought snacks for the car because one thing that became very uh, true, very quick in our married life, the Chapman household, when it goes on a road trip, always has snacks. And usually they're not healthy snacks, but they're really yummy. And so I had all that and, and I even took her a different way to Harrison than we would normally go to try and push off her figuring out where we were actually going. And it took her quite a while to figure out what we ended up doing, going to Harrison Hot Springs. And as I was congratulating myself in my mind of, of pulling off this amazing weekend where it was a total surprise to her, Pam kind of deflated my balloon a little bit. She said, honey, I love that you planned this. I love that you took charge and did all this. But next time, I would like it even more if you would tell me what we were doing. Because here's the thing. It makes me, it fills me with more joy when I can anticipate what we're coming to, as opposed to just being thrown into it. I learned a really good marriage lesson at that moment, that Pam doesn't love the big surprise. She, it dropped on her. She loves building up to the experience. She loves thinking through what it might be like. Now, don't get me wrong. Pam has no problem with small surprises. Like if flowers or chocolate or her favorite ice cream shows up at home without her knowing, hey, that's awesome. She loves that. She can get into that. But it's that, that aspect of these major things that she wants time to deal with, time to, to reflect on, time to think through, get excited about, that, that she expressed to me. And I can understand that a little bit. And I think Pam actually is, processes that kind of stuff like most of us do with the surprises in our life. Most of us don't appreciate major surprise being dropped on us in our life. We like time to build into it, time to work up to it, time to get ready for it. And yet that's not how life happens. Oftentimes it just happens to us and we gotta deal with it. As we come into this Christmas season, one of the things that I was thinking about is, I think, especially for those of us, this is not our first Christmas. It's many Christmases. One of the tensions I deal with is trying to make Christmas special, right? I mean, there's a whole list of things we got to do for Christmas. We got to get the tree. We got to put up the lights. We got to do the baking. We got to buy the gifts. We got to wrap them. We, in a normal year, we've got to coordinate calendars with the whole family so we can figure out when the gatherings are going to happen. All those mechanics of Christmas, sometimes for me, and maybe this is for you too, get in the way of what the essence of Christmas should really be like. And we get so focused on making sure all the list gets done that we forget to really enjoy what Christmas is supposed to be. A reminder of the birth of Jesus, the savior of the world. 
And so for this Christmas season, one of the things I'm going to try and do is to help you rediscover Christmas. To look at Christmas, not necessarily in a new way, but with fresh eyes. To re-look at Christmas through kind of the, this idea of surprise or curiosity or mystery or even wonder. And try and recapture that essence of Christmas. As opposed to getting bogged down with the mechanics of pulling off a good Christmas. We're going to look at the story of Jesus during this Christmas season. And this, for this week, I want to start in Luke chapter 1. And it's verses 26 to 38 that we're going to look at. And it's the story of the angel coming to Mary to announce to her that she's been chosen. It's the Annunciation to have the big technical term. And so starting in verse 26, it says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. It's a story that maybe you've heard or read. I certainly have a number of times. Almost every Christmas I read it or hear it or listen to it at some point. And so how do we look at this story that is so familiar and bring some fresh eyes to it? One of the ways that I often do that is try and read it in a different translation or a paraphrase. And so as I was preparing for the message, I read it out of Eugene's paraphrase, the message. And when I got to verse 30, this is what verse 30 says. He says, Mary, do not be afraid or you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. And that word surprise grabbed my attention. And I thought, wow, that is a cool concept, right? God had a surprise for Mary. He was going to surprise her. He was going to change her life. He was going to take her life and take it in an entirely new direction. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? That's often true for us, isn't it? God often takes our life in a moment and says, surprise, guess what? I've got something entirely new for you. I've got some new direction for you. I've got some different things for you. Are you willing to go? And as you read this passage, there are a number of surprising elements in this story. The first one that I see is this, this entire visit from an angel. Like, that is just not normal everyday occurrences. Mary had this surprise by an angel. God spoke to her through an angelic being. Surprise! And then you have the mention of this small little town called Nazareth. And I, I don't think we appreciate what a surprise Nazareth was. Most commentators uh, believe that Mary was a young teenager at this point. And she lived in this out-of-the-way, out-of-the-place, little, tiny, uh, hardly known town called Nazareth. It would be like saying an angel showed up in Puskupi, B.C. to a teenager and said to them and announced to them that, hey, you're going to be the next prime minister of Canada. Like, most of you have no idea where Puskupi is, do you? That's what the Jews would have thought of the town Nazareth. It meant nothing with a small teenager who would probably amount to nothing from a world perspective. And here was God surprising her in this little out of the way place with a message that she was going to be the mother of the long awaited Messiah. Now, 
Scripture tells us that when Mary received this visit from the angel and he started to speak to her, that his words troubled her. And she wondered what it could mean. We know very little about Mary, but one of the things I think we can say with certainty is this, that whatever Mary experienced, she was the type of person who would take those experiences in, those conversations in, and really think them through. In chapter 2, at the birth of Jesus, there's this verse that tells us that after the shepherds had left, uh, after visiting Jesus in the manger, that Mary took these things and treasured them and pondered them in her heart. She was kind of that reflective person to really think deeply on the experiences of life. And I think this is what's going on here in this passage when it tells us that she was troubled because she's really starting to think through, okay, what does this mean? What does this really mean? When God surprises you in life, here's the reality of it. Often his surprises involve incredible joy, but also involve sometimes suffering and pain. And you can almost see this thought process that Mary has that God's surprises are rarely easy and they're rarely simple. And so Mary, as she continues to think this through, might have thought, why me? I'm a teenager in the middle of nowhere. And it gives us a second to pause to realize that when God surprises people, he picks people not because of their merit, not because of who they are or what they can do for him. He picks people who are humble. He picks people who are willing, who are available, who are just willing to be obedient to whatever he asks them to do. And that's who Mary is. And so I think she's thinking, why me? And then she gets to this moment, almost what I would call a wait a minute God moment. And you can see it in her question. She says, okay, if I'm to be the mother of, a God, of Jesus, how am I supposed to do that when I'm a virgin? And you get this sense that Mary understood the angel to mean that God was asking her to become an expectant mother like right then. Like, it wasn't, hey, you know, when you get married to Joseph, your firstborn child, he'll be the Messiah. No, it was like right now. And so that's why her question is, well, how do I become pregnant when I'm a virgin? Because, you know, Gabriel, I know a lot about biology, and there's certain things that got to happen in order for that other thing to happen. And so then Gabriel takes a moment and explains to her in verse 35 what will happen. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And there's this beautiful picture of the Trinity in this verse where you have the Holy Spirit and God the Father coming together and then their end result is the Son of God growing in Mary's womb. And so you have this, this moment where Mary goes, okay, I can understand that, but I wonder if she had another kind of moment. It's not expressed here in Scripture. But I wonder if she had this other moment of, hey, wait a minute, God, when she realized that she would be pregnant and not married. And then for the culture of that day, that would be a huge, huge stigma. Not like our culture where oftentimes women get pregnant, aren't married, don't get married. In that day, she actually could have been stoned to death. And so in that moment, as the angel is telling her and she realizes that she will be pregnant and not married, it could mean a great deal of shame for her, possibly even her life. It's one of those moments that causes people to pause and go, okay, God, you're asking something really difficult here. You're asking something that may cause me pain. Am I willing to do that? Here's the thing in my experience. Whenever God drops a life surprise on you, there is usually this moment where you have, okay, wait a minute, God, I don't know if this is even possible. This impossibility that God has to step into in order for whatever he's calling you to do to take place. 19 years ago, I was uh, a painter and I was working on this really incredibly hard job. It was a 23 story high rise and things were going wrong left, right and center. And it was so bad that I was going in to work on Saturdays just by myself because we were behind and things were not going well. And I remember this one Saturday in October and I was sitting there out on a balcony, grinding it away, getting it ready, prepped to get painted. And I just had this 
final conversation with God. I said, God, I cannot do this anymore. And it wasn't as God spoke audibly to me, but he basically said to me, he said, that's okay, Brent, surprise. I want you to become a pastor. And so I, throughout that day, as I'm grinding and I'm having this conver internal conversation, dialogue with God, I said, okay, God, if that's the surprise you have for me, I'm okay with that. But here's the thing. I need you to do the impossible. I need you to convince Pam to do this because Pam did not sign up to marry a pastor. And I want her to come to the place where she understands that this is what we've got to do. And I don't want to have to say anything to her. And so I said, okay, God, I'm just going to pray about this. You got to speak to my wife. So for two weeks, I prayed. I said, okay, you got to talk to Pam. You got to bring this to Pam. It's not going to be me. And two weeks later, I'm lying in bed. Pam's lying in bed. We're getting ready to go to sleep. And she leans over to me and she says, Brent, I don't want you to laugh. But I think God wants us to go into ministry. And I think he wants you to become a pastor. Which, of course, then led me to laugh because then I had this whole story to share with her. But that was my wait a minute God moment. When God was trying to surprise me with a new direction in life, I had to come back to God and say, okay, here, you need to do the impossible because I can't do this. And he did. If you grew up in Canada, you went to school, and one of the things you had to do in school was to learn French, right? Now, I will admit I was not the best French student there have ever been. In fact, French for me was one, more one of those classes where I felt that I just needed to get it done so I could graduate. And yet, and so the, it shouldn't surprise anyone, but I don't remember a lot of my French, except for one phrase I really remember well. It's the phrase, quelle surprise. And that's a terrible French accent. So that's not even a French accent. I don't know why I said that accent, but that's the way it is. Quelle surprise. And, and I remember my grade eight self sitting in the classroom and we learn this phrase and it means what surprise, basically, literally, what surprise. And you say it when something happens that surprises you. But here's the other aspect of it. In the French language, you can also use it to, uh, to convey an irony, meaning that you use the phrase in a situation that actually goes according to plan or goes as you predicted. And so whatever happens, you go, oh, quelle surprise. I mean, for me, it was, it was speaking my language. And that's probably why I remember it the best, because part of my language is sarcasm. And so irony is right there for me. And so I would use it, you know, in grade eight class, I'd be sitting there and Monsieur Odette at the end of class would assign us a bunch of homework. And I would mutter just loud enough so my friends could hear me who were sitting beside me. Quelle surprise. Right. Homework again. What a surprise. And here's the thing. When God brings surprises into our life. There are some quelle surprise moments, meaning that there are some things that we can be certain of when God springs a surprise in our life. And there's a couple that are found in this passage. And let me just point two of them out. The first one is found in verse 28, when the angel first talks to Mary and he says this, the Lord is with you. It's this promise that God is with us. If God is going to surprise us in life, his promise will be he will be with us. And here's the thing. This wasn't a promise just for Mary. Later on in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus will make the same promise to his disciples as he's leaving them. And it's a promise to the church. He says, as I, I'm sending you, as you go into this world to make disciples, I will be with you always until the end of the age. I will be with you always. That promise to be with you. That promise for Mary, that promise for us. That same promise that when God shows up and surprises us with something, his promise the quelle surprise moment is this, I will be with you in this. The second piece, and you see this at the end of the, the story, is verse 37 where the angel tells her, for no word from God will ever fail. And in this context, what the angel is telling her is this, is that this long awaited word of God, this word of a Messiah is finally coming true. And no matter how long it takes, God's word do comes to pass. And it is a messianic promise for sure. But I think there's also some other aspect to it, that when God's promises are stated in Scripture, He will fulfill them. His promise to be with you is one of those. But there's also a second promise that I see in here, and it's the promise that nothing is impossible with God. 
And that's why I think he gives the example of her cousin Mary being pregnant. Even though she's an old woman, even though no one thought she would ever be able to get pregnant, she was pregnant in her sixth month. And his, his admonition to Mary is this, God can do the impossible. And so if he surprises you with something that you think is impossible, he can do it. So whatever life surprise comes your way, whatever you face, remember this, that God is with you and that his promises never fail and that he can do the impossible in you and through you too, which ultimately left Mary with a choice. Do you accept what God is asking you to accept? She had to decide whether she was willing to step into that surprise, willing to step into the thing that God had for her, willing to be obedient. And it's the same type of choice that you and I face when God comes to us with a God surprise in our life. Are we willing to step in with obedience to do the thing God has asked us to do? And as you think about that, for some of you, you can reflect on God surprise moments in your life to see whether that was true or not. For some of you right now, maybe God is asking something of you that you're afraid to do, that you're not willing to step into, or you're, you're pondering it and you're wondering what it could mean. And you see a lot of the impossibilities before you instead of the path that God wants you to go down. Think about this for a couple things. God chose to honor Mary. He took a humble teenager and blessed her and showed his grace to her. And it was nothing of who she was it was just because she was willing to be obedient and do what God asked her to do. And maybe the thing that God is asking you to do, you're wondering, I don't have the skill for that. I don't have the money for that. I don't have whatever it is you don't have. Stop worrying about it and just be willing to be obedient. The second thing I think is, is that when God comes to us with one of his surprises, our first reaction should be this. Instead of freaking out and saying no or looking at all the possibilities, we just need to sit and listen. We need to ponder and think through what this could be about. Where could this go? What could God do in our life? And then, of course, the last thing. And this is, I think, was surprising for me as I saw this. At the, the end result of God's surprise for Mary is that she would have Jesus inside of her physically. For us, that's not going to happen. But scripture tells us that when we accept who God is and we accept Jesus into our life, he actually spiritually comes in us. There's a great verse in Ephesians chapter 3 and it's verse 17 and Paul writes this and he says these things, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Christ can be in your heart. And so in essence, what Paul is saying is we can experience similar to what Mary experienced, that we can have God in us Jesus can be in us. And so that when God comes to surprise us, we're not on our own. We're not by ourselves. He is there with us, walking every step of the way, willing to do the impossible so that we can accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. And so really, at the end of the day, we're all faced with the same question that Mary was faced, with the surprise that God drops on our life. Will I be obedient? It's the same question God asks you today. Will you be obedient? Will you step into what I'm calling you to do? Will you step into the surprise I have for your life? Even if it is tough, even if you don't see how it can be done, will you just do it? For some of you listening today, you might be on this journey towards Jesus and you actually haven't come to the place where you've accepted who Jesus is. You haven't turned your life over to him. And today might be the day that God is saying to you, look, surprise, I've got this life for you, but it starts when you turn your life over to me. When you come to the place where you acknowledge your sin, where you come to the place where you acknowledge your shortcomings, where you come to the place where you understand that the best life for you is the life when God is with you and for you. And so today might be the day that God says surprise and your response just needs to be, okay, Jesus, I'm in. I don't know what roadblocks in your way. I don't know what impossibilities you think there are. But at some point, you have to come to the place and through faith and obedience, just say, okay, Jesus, I'm in. This is a reminder, this story, that life is full of surprises. But even in that, 
If you have your life in Jesus and as Jesus is in your heart, that we never have to worry about the surprises of life because he is always with us and he will see us through those surprises. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this reminder of this story of surprise. Lord, it is good to think through and think on who Mary was and her response to how you just interrupted her life and brought this amazing surprise to her. It changed her life. And yet she was willing to go through the hardship to experience the joy and willing to go on this journey that you asked her to go on. And she did it faithfully. Lord, I pray for us. I pray that we would take those same steps that Mary had, that we would face the surprises of life with the same confidence that Mary had, that you will be with us, that you will see us through, even when we think it's impossible and even when it's hard, so that we can see the joy of what it means to follow you with our whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks, Southridge, for joining us today on this first Sunday of our Christmas series. I'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks as we look at other themes that will come out of this story. Curiosity, mystery, wonder. We have a ton of things that are going on in the month of December, and our host told you about them. So I would encourage you to go to our website, sign up for some of them, get really plugged in, so that you don't just go through the mechanics of Christmas, you actually experience the essence of Christmas. And be reminded that God is working in our world, that he's alive and he wants to work through you. Have a great week, Southridge, and we'll see you back next Sunday.